Great, so welcome everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, before I begin, just a few thank yous. I, um, let's see. Sorry, there we go, yeah. Um, as an independent artist, um, I could not participate in the conference here today and wouldn't have been able to bring my installation here without the really generous support of Atlantic Center for the Arts, the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, the Robert McMillan Foundation, the Puffin Foundation, and Ocean Alliance. So thank you very much to these organizations for making this conference possible for me and for my work. So my presentation begins um, with just a little general introduction to my studio practice and my place-based sound works. And then we'll talk a little bit about whales and then finish with hopefully some ways that my work and our work together can make a difference. So this quote by Barry Lopez has been um, at the forefront of my mind in the past year or two as I've been joining forces with Groups of artists and nonprofit organizations, um, art does not aspire to entertain, it aspires to converse. So my name is Perry Lynch Howard. I'm a socially engaged artist whose current work in sound and in paintings reimagines the world's oceans, rivers, and coastlines, not as the watery backdrop of our human lives, but as precious habitat for marine life in increasingly noisy waters. My work explores the relationship between human perception and sense of place through painting, drawing, sculpture, and sound. And this is an example of one of my sculptures. It's located in Magnuson Park in Seattle, Washington. It's a kilometer long artwork called Straight Shot. And it's a series of standing stones. The distance doubles between each pair of stones. So it takes 12 stones to go the length of a kilometer. Straight Shot has these uh, drill holes through the stones so one can stand at one end and sight through them, getting that sort of uh, perceptual awareness and place-based awareness that say like a surveyor would have. This is an example of a temporary work that I completed at the Playa Institute last year. It's called Standing Water. I don't know if any of you have been to this landscape, but it's located on the very north end of the um, Great Basin in the United States. And um, the playa is a giant body of water that's always moving, but it's not tidally driven. In the words of one of the poets I was there with, Liz All, she said, the playa, it's more like breathing than it is like tides. And I got interested in trying to map that situation. So here I am setting little survey flags out on the playa um, where the edge of the water was one day is where it was not the next day. And I did that over the course of a month. This is a really nice quiet place. And my work in visual art is very much um, driven by my work with sound. I think of the public artworks and the visual arts um, as material traces of, as, of the world that I inhabit through listening. So most of the places I investigate exist in the physical world, but some do not. Some are landscapes of my imagination or destinations that I'm traveling toward. This piece is titled Taste It. It's 48 inches wide by 32 inches tall, uh, and I created it after that time at Playa. This is an image field recording in um, also in the Great Basin, but from a really different vantage point. This is at the Montello Foundation. And um, it is the world's first quiet designated artist residency. They just received that designation a couple of months ago. Um, so that's a really exciting thing. And I was down there looking at uh, the presence of water in an arid landscape. This is doing hydrophone recording in one of the troughs out there. These are some of the details of the visual world that I tend to tune into when I'm listening. And this is a piece of artwork I made in response. It's called Lost Legends. It's 30 inches wide by 18 inches high. 
And then I have just a few more of the visual works to share with you. So these artworks to me are driven by the landscape, but also driven by the sonic landscape. This is called Turning the Tide from 2022, 36 inches wide. Sometimes, and I don't know how this happens, but sometimes the artwork arrives before the experience does. This is a piece that I made uh, early last year prior to my experience in the Arctic Circle just a couple of months ago. This piece is called Moonshot Harbor from 2021. So in the past six months, I've traveled to Svalbard and to the Zabala region of the Ecuadorian Amazon. Recording sounds from these places on the front lines of climate change, but where climate driven imperatives are manifesting in super different ways. I wanted to better understand the sonic signature of these places that we think of as extreme and how the sonic signature is changing due to climate driven imperatives. So my experience in Svalbard, uh, my good friend Mary Edwards was also um, on that residency and it was through the Arctic Circle residency program. We were on a Barkentine tall ship for 16 days out of Longyearbyen. With this, <laughs> with this group of people that was like no fun at all, right? Like <laughs> these people like, oh my gosh, you know, insufferable. It was wonderful, it was wonderful. I wanna tell you about every single one of them, but just know it's like artists, scientists, journalists, dancers, singers, saxophonists, uh, and one hydro feminist. And I still am not exactly sure what that means, but anyway, anyway, anyway. Yeah, so um, again, this is um, my, most of my practice while I was up in Svalbard was sound driven. I recorded every single day in all kinds of environments that were icy and cold. Um, but also creating um, a visual response to it, right? This material trace of the sonic experience. And then these are just some of the landscapes that we um, experienced up there and recorded. This is um, setting up my mix pre six and my UC pros on the gunnel of the boat and recording with a contact microphone, these little icebergs as they were moving around, the waiters were almost warm enough. And this is waiting for um, glaciers to calve with the shotgun mic. And this is a long story that Mary knows, um, but I'm out in the middle of these ice boulders here um, doing hydrophone recordings and then that glacier in the background had a huge calving event and this giant wave came and I'll tell you about the rest of it, like over beers or something. It's, but um, it was an amazing recording environment and this opportunity to record quiet water um, was absolutely profound to me. There was no ship traffic up there besides us. It was so late in the season. Yeah, so um, this is a painting now shifting to sort of the um, Ecuadorian experience again. Um, seeking quiet water in places that are on the front lines of climate change. So this is a piece called Groundswell that I painted before that experience. And this is some of the landscapes that we saw down in Ecuador. And to me, it's like sometimes just amazing that the gear works at all, you know? But I can tell you the same kit worked in the Arctic that worked in the Amazon without any problem. So like that's kit for life for me anyway. Yeah, so um, in July of 2022, I was an artist in residence at the Rocky Neck Art Colony, and this is in Gloucester, Massachusetts. I wanted to look at the impacts of sea level rise and a warming ocean on this 400 year old seafaring community. And again, to do some listening with an ear toward how the sonic signature of Gloucester was changing. So the day I arrived, I was out walking the docks and I stumbled into the world headquarters of Ocean Alliance, which is located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. It looked like a suite of abandoned buildings, um, but there I met Mark Hayes, who is a member of the research team at Ocean Alliance. And he introduced me to the groundbreaking work that many of you are familiar with, the work of Roger Payne, Katie Payne and their colleagues. In the early 1970s, Dr. Payne made the happenstance discovery that whales not only 
make sound, but that they sing songs, right? Humpback whales in particular, but many whales. Um, so Mark, <laughs> Mark reached into this cabinet and held up a vinyl record. And I recognized the album cover instantly. Songs of the Humpback Whale. Do any of you know? Yeah, we know. Yeah, this crowd knows for sure. Yeah, right. Um, and I was flooded with these like really embarrassing memories of my seven-year-old self playing the record over and over on the RCA turntable in our sunken living room while pressing my pajama-footed body up against giant brown speakers, much to the dismay of my Marlboro smoking, martini drinking parents, right? <laughs> But, but hearing the songs of the humpback whales uh, connected the listening public um, with these animals and inspired the Save the Whales movement, which led to a global moratorium on commercial whaling in not too long a time, right, 1982. Um, but what I'm learning now is that, you know, whale conservation requires a whole lot of science, but that day on the docks in Gloucester, I learned that it began with a song. And that to me was a sign that artists have a super important role to play in environmental stewardship. So it's our job, if you will, to turn the sounds into songs and help the world become great listeners. So I crossed the threshold into like a really stinky, uh, like research room there at Ocean Alliance and lifted into this super dank old case and like pulled up my first spectrogram. And it's images of those spectrograms that are hanging in my painting studio for you to see. This is just a group of drawings that I made in response. And then this is a rough map of the sound that's playing in the painting studio. Um, at the beginning of the recording's about 10 minutes long. You hear bell buoys and ocean waves at the beginning followed by the voices of the researchers. I think the oldest, um, the oldest track that I was working from was from 1954 and then through the 70s. Um, that moves into humpback whales and then underwater sonar um, and cargo ship traffic, which I recorded in the Strait of Juan de Fuca with a hydrophone on my paddleboard, like what could go wrong. Um, and then it returns to whales and the marine weather forecast. So in, in, an, in a non-didactic way, I really want people to consider the presence of quiet water, the importance of preserving quiet water, and how things shift when we introduce marine traffic. So one of the um, really important things guiding my practice right now is joining forces, you know, like what can one artist do about climate change, right? What could one of us do about climate change? I think the key is to stop thinking of myself as one artist, you know? Working with nonprofits have um, brought my work far outside the art world in ways I could never imagine. And this is the link for Ocean Alliance if you wanna learn more about their drone-based whale research, whale.org. They've come a long way since the 70s when Roger Payne founded it. And this is the other organization that I'm working really closely with, Quiet Parks International. I work as a field recording ambassador for Quiet Parks International. Um, Gordon and I are really excited to be here next year for the field station, uh, Soundscape Field Station residency. And then what's next? For me, um, I'm touring around this um, a talk called Svalbard Speaks, and it's about an artist dialoguing with climate change. And if you're interested in bringing this talk and presentation to your community or your school, I'd love to talk about the possibilities. Um, it's a sound-based presentation. And um, it's been really, really fun to present and share the stories from the Arctic. And these are some opportunities to see my work, mostly throughout West, soundings in Twist, Washington, which is where I live up in the North Cascades, August at the Seattle Art Museum, February back here for Soundscape Field Station, and then in 2025, um, the water-based projects will be on exhibit at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And this is how to reach me. So thank you all very much. No, thank you for that question. The question is um, regarding the presence of human voices in my installation, which is here. It's also available on Vimeo for folks that are not here. Um, 
To be honest with you, I was greatly inspired by the theme for the conference of listening past, listening futures, that we really can't talk about the way that bioacoustics um, are happening today without their deep roots uh, in the history of science and the history of whale research um, and our connection to the unseen, if you will, below water. Um, and there were some early images that I saw at Ocean Alliance of these researchers sitting in like little Boston whalers that are 17 feet long with like a reel to reel on their lap, bouncing around, listening to things that maybe they don't even know are whales yet. And I just wanna make sure that given all the technology we have to explore the wor world with sound that we never forget those early moments of bioacoustics. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, sure. The question is how do we consider the wor word quiet as we talk about sound, is that a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, great. So I um, work with the word quiet in terms of it relative to anthropogenic sound and human generated sound. And it's a really great, great question because down in um, the Zabala region in the Amazon with the Kofan tribe, you know, um, many people that are working with sound, people that I was down there with were saying like, well, tribal voices, indigenous voices are part of the soundscape, but our voices are not. And I absolutely respect any kind of way that people try to parse away what signal, what's noise, what's quiet, what's loud. But for the purposes of what I'm investigating, I'm interested in using my work to help preserve natural quiet. Yeah. Oh, you, I, I, when I think of natural quiet, it's, it's not the human presence. Yeah. But I have no um, right or wrong about that. I mean, the panel last night was a great example of how diverse our opinions can be around these issues without being in conflict with each other. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Claude. Um, what are some of the barriers to an individual artist collaborating with a like-minded nonprofit? Is the question yes? Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Yeah, some of the barriers is that I'm kind of useless, you know, like, <laughs> I'm like very useless. Like they're doing their research. Like I don't know how to land a drone on a whale and send the D tag down under the, I mean, I'm useless. Like I have no um, way that I can really help them except by amplifying their story and maybe discovering nuances and points of appreciation within their practice that perhaps they're out of touch with. But besides that, it's like really hard. Um, struggles in my practice now, I cannot get out on a research boat. Like I keep trying and trying and trying to find a way to um, dovetail with scientific research anywhere around the Arctic Circle. And I just can't find uh, organizations that will take that on. I mean, the residencies are wonderful. You know, the residencies have been the way that I generally interact. Um, but after being at CU with 30 artists, I kind of needed the groundedness of science to go forward. And, you know, that's just a shift in my own awareness and my own development. So um, that's a big barrier is sort of being invited onto the science team or in proximity to the science team so that I can really understand their challenges better. Yeah, any other questions? Thank you. I just received validation from the audience here that I am not useless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the, this is really exciting. So this is a question about my plans for the Soundscape Field Station residency for next year with Gordon Hempton. Um, plans, plans, plans. Well, you know, like Gordon and I haven't really we gotta like, like get on board with each other and that. We haven't talked about what that collaboration will look like yet, but we will. Um, but for me, what I'm really interested in down here are the edges. And some of you heard this through the sound walk the, a couple of days ago. Um, I'm really interested in the edges here, like, like lagoon launch site, you know? And like beautiful, pristine coastline, busy, busy, busy little towns up and down. You know, so it's the edges for me, uh, they get me excited uh, sonically and listening wise because it's the edges where the friction exists. And um, I wanna understand better the frictions that are working here. Yeah. 
Someone? Yeah? Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.